here's something in the right place. It's a mouldboard plough. It's rather like hanging up some of the burners out of the ovens at Dachau, a relic of the age of agriculture which is just passing. And while there's plenty of food in this garden, there's no need of ploughs. There are over 500 species, so that even in winter, there's enough food for all the family and neighbours. Ah, uh, kumquats, fortunella. One of my favourite fruit, I think. Especially after a month or two in brandy and sugar. This is a Japanese parsley. Call these throwover greens. They're all important for the health of chickens. A bath full of Chinese water chestnuts, which are delicious. You can buy them in cans, but... Here you get them fresh, and they're always crisp. Nothing like sitting by an Indian pond and watching a lot of very graceful women in saris picking water chestnuts and putting them into brass bowls. Very sensual. This garden is extremely rich in species, and at every time of year, something's in flower. Here we have lavender, and dotted throughout the garden are about a dozen homemade beehives so that in winter time you can get considerable cheer from honey mead. But instead of drinking merrily in our gardens, most people prefer to work mowing lawns. Yet Mollison thinks this green cancer is a serious threat. The problem with this agriculture is, although it uses up more resources than what most of us think of as agriculture, that is food agriculture, it has no use at all. And the weight up cost is somewhere near four dollars per square foot to maintain them annually. And that doesn't count for the cost of the fuel and the manpower and the labour of maintaining these strange deflection states in the city that nobody really uses. Well, being a good urban gorilla, we might start a revolution by putting a hazelnut in the lawn. People may not use lawns, but they look at them. All the great gardens of history have been neatly designed, carefully sculptured arrangements. Compositions that appeal to our order and aesthetics. We believe in symmetry and we have built palatial landscapes to overcome our disappointment with nature's chaos. We want to live in a world where nature is tidy, hygienic and safe. But nature's not worried about aesthetics. It's interested in abundance. Ugly mangrove swamps, for example, are the most productive environment on the planet. We've always been very ambivalent in our approach to mangroves. They're not easily accessible. They're muddy and smell a little bit and they're spiky. The smell is a sign of its fertility. The decomposing organic matter provides the food for the hundreds of fish and crab species that breed within its waters. For years, we've been filling them in, cutting mangroves down. We've been dredging out these streams and turning them into uh, middle-class residential suburbs. The, um, high tide marks clearly indicated here on the retaining walls by a black line and that leaves you one or two feet of sea level rise within our projections of the 40-year sea rise all this capital all this effort all these people won't be here because most of this will be sea shallow seas it may be a lot more productive but it's surely going to lay waste a tremendous amount of human effort and resource Everybody has a tuna boat, but in two or three years there won't be any more tuna. And that's a law of stupidity or extinction. It's to turn a highly productive natural system into a high consuming artificial system. The more you walk around places like this, the more surreal they become. Lawns are giving way to astroturf. There's a lot of television sets on in this neighbourhood. I think they might be watching wildlife films. And there are a great many exploration vehicles 
four-wheel drives that will carry you to the wilderness. So it's as though they're chasing something that's just disappearing in front of them all the time. Let's wake up and let's get real. Stop and play and take the wheel. Five billion people with each one seed could we plant all the forest in just one week. Plant a garden and plant enough coffee with a really grow. Do it in your own little space. Daikon. Four billion years <laughs> on this here globe is a lot of evolution, so I've been told. Highly evolved though we may be, we need to get a sense of ecology. Masanobu, Fukuoka, Bill Mollison, too, with Jackson and people like me and you. We make a difference in the world. We make a sound profound when we pass the word around. Permaculture. Permaculture. Super client is Gaia. She's the queen because we're all a part of her living machine. It's up to us, the permaculture crew, to see this madness through and through. Set an example for the world to see. Bring our mother back to harmony. One of the great dangers that we are now facing is that we play around with a genetic base of things. Uh, for instance, a good example is that to prevent uh, strawberries frosting, I think in California, they've altered the nature of the bacterium, Pseudomonas syringae so that the frost can't settle on the crop, and that's a genetic alteration. The very same bacterium is a very efficient cloud seeding organism, and we may be depending on that bacterium and its allies for rain. So uh, do we risk stopping rain in the whole world to stop frost settling on a California strawberry crop? We should make scientists accountable. At present, they're basically sociopaths. Bill thinks that before manipulating individual genetic components, we should understand their role in the planetary system. Already we have begun destabilizing global weather patterns, and we know little of how to control it. But our most valuable resources are provided by nature. We think that water is abundant, yet at any one time, only 3% of the water of the planet is fresh and almost all of it is trapped in ice. The remainder is being continually moved and purified as the sun drives the water cycle. The forests are the major pumps and collectors of this cycle and trap three quarters of this precious water. For every uh, three inches of this litter, we can absorb one inch of rain. So the, there's a great... Um, absorbent carpet on the floor. So basically you can look on the rainforest as a tree system or you can look on it as a lake. The forest transpires water to the air and rehumidifies that air. It's therefore a cloud generator. And then the forest gives off bacterial colonies to the airstream. And these are the ice nuclei from clouds. So the forest, in every real sense, creates its own rainfall. The forest will create five or six hundred percent more rainfall than a non-forested landscape. So the river and the forest uh, have a constant interdependence. The river in the whole forest is as the sap is in the whole tree. And uh, the river takes nutrients both ways. The fish swim up and the phosphate from the fish can flash out into this forest through birds and animals. And the forest gives leaf material to the river. So if we clear this forest in this climate for agriculture, we don't have, we have maybe 14% of the nutrient of the total system in the soil. And we lose the soil, we lose the nutrients, we lose the game. In many parts of the world, the game is already lost. Haiti has no soil. It's down to bare rock. Famines in Ethiopia are caused by a drop in agricultural productivity of over 4,000%.
Much of the world's forests are being logged and sold to the wealthy nations. Living on barren land, the local population is forced to destroy the few remaining resources just to survive to the end of the week. It's certainly possible for us to extend forests over enormous areas that we have cleared historically or destroyed. And that's probably the only job that we have left on Earth that is, uh, can express our humanity, is to return other species to their place and uh, take our place, which is a small place, in the total system. <laughs>